Hello all and welcome to Sweating the Small Stuff, a show where we sweat over the details that make our world richer. I'm your personal brain trainer, Cameron Buzard Jamari, and today I'm joined by a special guest. Uh, Matt, would you like to introduce yourself? I am Matt Brady. I'm a high school science teacher. I teach physics and chemistry. I'm also the co-founder, along with my wife, of thescienceof.org, where we both use pop culture to get people interested in science. It's a reflection of what we do in our classrooms. Uh, we both use a lot of pop culture to get our kids thinking about science and thinking about, in some cases, why not? Why can't I have these cool things that I see in movies or TV or comics? And that is the exact beauty of why I wanted to have you on. Since I saw your presentation at AwesomeCon, I knew that I had to interview you and learn more about your work because that's exactly what we try to do here at Swagging the Small Stuff. We want to take those ideas you're already familiar with, the science and pop culture to make STEM education that vital, engaging thing that everyone just comes to love and takes them on that path of becoming engineers and scientists and doctors and all the other things we want to be when we grow up. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. And, and what you said is pretty much what uh, what my wife and I both do in our classrooms. She teaches biology um, and uses the similar approach. Uh, it all kind of got started, I guess, to take it back um, to when I started teaching 10 years ago. Just finished up my, my 10th year of teaching. And uh, I went into a Title I school and Title I school, if you're not familiar with the government programs and lingo, is it, it's a kind of a, a program that's tied to the uh, number of students that receive free and reduced lunch in the school. And, uh, it's, it's a, it's a marker for poverty, basically. That's kind of a shorthand for poverty. And so the school I went into was Title I, mostly black and Hispanic. Um, I'm white. And so I needed some way to talk to these kids to make it relevant, to make myself be taken seriously or at least be listened to at the very least. Um, and when I started teaching, I had just come off of 15 years of working in pop culture. Uh, I co-founded a website called newsarama.com, which is still around today. Uh, it was one of the biggest pop culture websites at the time, covering comic books and movies and toys, we had the good fortune to be around right as things were taking off, right as comics were just starting. We mm -hmm. I think we reported on, you know, this first new X-Men movie, which is supposed to be kind of good. And who is this Brian Singer guy anyway type of thing? <laughs> so I yeah. think I'm dating myself there. Uh, but but I started using pop culture uh, and it, it got the students to kind of like I said, wake up a little bit and go, this guy might be kind of interesting. And that's the great thing about pop culture is that it's cool. Yeah. It doesn't have a native tongue. It's just cool. And so I can show a picture, a movie clip from Fast and the Furious. I can show a movie clip from really any Spider-Man movie ever. I can show a movie clip. I even use a movie clip from uh, Lethal Weapon to illustrate an idea with momentum and impulse. And it's just cool. And you're drawn to it. As my wife says, we use pop culture as the Trojan horse, that that idea gets into your brain. And then once you're thinking, oh, I know this, this is kind of cool. The science just spills out. Now that it's kind of taken some ownership in your brain, now we can talk about the science and you're already invested in it. You kind of know it a little bit. Exactly. And that's a lot of what you like to do on this show is say this this thing you already are familiar with, this thing that you already enjoy, there's there's a little detail in there you probably didn't notice that really paints everything in a deeper light. And I appreciate how your organization specifically says, we're going to take this curriculum, this, like, I, I remember being in physics class. I was in, uh, I was fortunate enough to be in the International Baccalaureate program when I was in high school. Oh, really? And oh, I took, great. yes, I took uh, the higher level physics courses and I remember just it was not easy to consume a lot of that material. Right, right. And then I saw your, you had a very interesting, you, you were doing some demos of the different kind of curriculum you created. And I remember one of the ones you did had to do with Deadpool jumping into a car. That was the, the very first one, kind of the, the idea that got this whole thing really rolling in a big way was when I was reviewing i i started teaching ib physics and i inherited a class and so that meant i hadn't taught them as juniors but i was teaching them as seniors and so i needed to know what they knew about uh motion 
And those are the, if I can remind you of them, the kinematic formulas. I needed to review them in a way that was as painless as possible, but also as rigorous as possible. And there are many dry labs out there that you can use. And what I did was found this this typical lab. It's the drop a object into a constantly moving toy vehicle at the on the ground and see if you can hit it because you have to calculate how far that vehicle will be in the time it takes you to drop that thing and for it to travel down uh, as it's accelerating because it's falling faster and faster and hit that car, truck, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty standard lab. It's a pretty boring lab. And at that time, this was, well, before Deadpool had come out, the trailer for Deadpool had just come out and I was watching it. My kids were excited about it. And I saw that scene in the trailer where he stepped off the overpass and fell into right into the SUV. And I watched it again and I thought, that's exactly what we're doing. <laughs> and so I wrote it up, put it together as a, as a lab. And my students were just, they were totally into it, totally into it. The, the little marble that they were dropping wasn't a marble. It was him. It was Deadpool. And the car, we had these janky constant velocity buggies that just chugged along and I had to make a catcher. So they were these little toy buggies with a Dixie cup in the back with a Kleenex in it to, so the marble wouldn't bounce out if it landed in there. And it was to look at it. It just took a lot of imagination to see it as what they were seeing in the movie trailer. But they did it and they were engaged and they worked so hard because, as I said earlier, they had some ownership. They they knew Deadpool. They knew the trailer. The trailer was cool. That information, that pop culture bit had already taken up a place in their brain. And so now I was just going in and adding some science to it and adding a little bit more to it, making them figure some stuff out. It made that lab – painless for them and it made that lab exciting and fun which you know sometimes you can have happen in a physics lab more often than not fun is not necessarily a word that physics students associate with their labs um, it's not a term i ever associated with school at all so <laughs> but yeah it 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 really really took off and kind of to my amazement the the i did that with seniors and then the juniors heard about it and they were like oh can we do the deadpool drop I said, the, the what? And they had already given it a name. <laughs> and so I kind of came upon this phenomenon where I started naming my labs that that was the Deadpool drop lab. And it was a known thing that if you were in Mr. Brady's class, sooner or later, you were going to do the Deadpool drop lab. And it was really cool. And you had to figure out how to get Deadpool into the SUV. I've worked to develop a number of different labs, of different worksheets, of different investigations um, that students have to kind of start with that pop culture and try to figure things out based in that pop culture. One of my favorite ones, I think I did this after Awesome Con, uh, was to model Gwen Stacy's fall. I was actually about to ask you about that because if I recall, you mentioned that some of your, uh, well, some of the students had a surprisingly visceral reaction to it. Yes, yes. It was, it was actually my wife's idea because I always wanted to uh, model this out and get develop a lab or some kind of demonstration that can be done in a classroom. And and as interesting as it is, I use just a bit of the movie clip from, what is it, the second Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movie that shows uh, Gwen Stacy being caught by the webbing and then the fall that clearly, clearly breaks her neck. If you don't mind, let me set the stage for our listeners. Sure. So for anyone who didn't see The Amazing Spider-Man 2 or is not read up on the comics, there's a distinct point where Spider-Man goes from catching people directly with his webbing by like shooting it and trying to catch them on their bodies to putting like a basically a trampoline layer down beneath them. And that's because of this pivotal scene that they brought into The Amazing Spider-Man 2 where Spider-Man is trying to catch Gwen. And if you know anything about momentum, it's that when you try to slow down something large moving quickly, the deceleration is going to really whip that is basically just going to apply a lot of unexpected force to that mass and cause that body to have for lack of a better word a uh 
I guess you could just call it nothing other than whiplash. Just horrible whiplash. A bad time. A bad time. Yeah, that's that's the um that's the root of the saying it's not the fall that kills you, it's a sudden stop. It's that change in momentum, that going from whatever your velocity is to going zero meters per second. That's what kills you. It's not the fall. You're fine during the fall. That's why your car has airbags too. You're gonna hit that steering wheel, but boy, I'd like to take my time getting there. And it's obnoxious across all the different sci-fi franchises. There's always that moment where the hero's falling and falling and falling, and then Iron Man suddenly turns on his boosters, and now he can change direction, and he's fine. It's like, no, you you change directions three feet from the ground. You're right, not fine. Right. And uh, as I watch stuff, I see a little bit of... Sometimes it's a bit... It's done a bit better than others. Uh, there was the scene at the beginning of um, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, where Miles was falling and Spider-Man had to swing by and catch him. And he kind of, it looked like at least they were maybe giving a little bit of attention to that of let's slow Miles down a little bit, take our time doing it rather than just sudden stop. But my my favorite one recently um, was Shazam when uh, in the scene, it was in the trailers as well the the bus fell off the bridge yeah and he positioned himself on the ground and he stopped the bus he didn't fly up and catch the bus or fly up and stop the bus from falling the bus fell and he stopped the bus he caught the bus right above the ground and i i tweeted about that and had a bunch of people join in and say yeah the effect would have been the same as hitting the ground and yeah. the only good thing that Shazam did was he kept all the bodies in one place so he could <laughs> transport them to the morgue and <laughs> and have the coroner just go, oh, okay, number one, number two, number three. Yeah, there was – Oh, goodness. <laughs> that that kind of drives me nuts because and, – and I promise we'll get back to Gwen Stacy in a minute. Um, it drives me nuts because, you know, you see that and I have a bunch of people that say, what's the harm in it? What's the harm? Who cares? If – after – Every article that shows up and um, Rhett, Rhett Elaine that writes for Wired Magazine, he and I talk about this a couple times. Every time you write one of these articles about how, well, the science would be this actually and this is how it would work out, somebody posts and says, what does it matter? It's just a story. It's, it's fiction. So I don't expect it to be real. OK. All right. Yeah. You know, 25 years ago. I get your point. I get your point completely. But now something like the Shazam, you know, not that any kid is going to go out and try to catch a bus. That's that's not a good idea. Kids don't do that. <laughs> um, but a kid might get an idea that it really doesn't matter and the people will be OK in that kind mm -hmm. of situation. And they might get another idea from something else in pop culture with bad science in it. And as I've started kind of arguing and kind of turning this this thing that started as a as a passion and sometimes can feel more like a holy mission, it's great to just go, what does it matter? It's fiction. That's all good, well and good. But, you know, when I see that kid in 11th grade who was influenced by pop culture and tells me that the earth is flat or that vaccine doesn't vaccines don't do anything and actually harm you, it's – it sounds like a bit of a stretch to draw a straight line between bad science fiction or bad science, pardon me, in a movie and flat earthers, but I, I can kind of draw it. Pop culture has a huge influence in our lives and the messages that come out in pop culture, good or bad, do – take up some cognitive space in the audience. I think a big thing that is important for getting the science right, and I was fortunate enough, I don't remember if you got a chance to interact with uh, Dr. Erin McDonald or not. I didn't, I didn't. I, I had emailed her before and, and chatted with her a little bit, but I didn't get a chance to talk to her at, at AwesomeCon. Afterwards, we got to have a conversation, and she's a delight. And one of the things we kept coming back to was the importance of getting science right, because at the end of the day, physics is kind of this universal thing. Like, you go to a different planet, and the food is different and the creatures look different and they fly different things and blah, blah, blah. But physics is a universal concept throughout our universe. When you don't get fundamental things about the way the world works right, it can – and I realize this is such a nitpick, but it really does – affect the uh what's it called the uh suspension of disbelief right right it kind of shatters your ability to become invested in this world and acknowledge like oh this is how things are no it's not because now he has caught a busload full of corpses and no one's enjoying that right right and i and i've i've had discussions with 
comic writers and, and fans and people in, in publishing about it. And it, it kind of runs the gamut of, you know, nobody wants to read that. Nobody wants to, to do this or nobody, you know, it doesn't matter. It's fiction. And then, you know, when I say, well, then have Superman, you know, fly around the world and, and turn back time in your comic story. Well, he can't do that. Well, he's not paying attention to these rules. So why does he have to pay attention to those rules? I'm, uh, needless to say, not the most popular person at parties. With, with that <laughs> You're the kinda, Neil deGrasse Tyson of the parties. Yeah, uh, not that, not quite there yet. But, but yeah, exactly what you're saying. It, it, it is kind of. I think everybody has a line. Um, I'd like to move universally that line up a little bit. So, so maybe we get, some, you know, a little bit more real science uh, involved in things. There, there are things I'm totally willing to suspend my disbelief on and totally willing just to let go yeah before we go further down this rabbit hole maybe we should give our attention back to poor gwen stacy oh, poor gwen still stacy. Yeah, yeah yeah so so gwen stacy so yeah we did the i figured out the demonstration actually my wife figured out the demonstration for gwen stacy i was i um teach right across the hall from her and i said i want to figure out something how to model gwen stacy and i was thinking i have plenty of action figures in my room or how i could work this out and she just said well make her out of spaghetti Five pieces of spaghetti were her body, mm -hmm. and then that one piece, one of those five, I kept long. I broke the rest off, kind of short, to be the torso down and up to shoulders. But that one I kept, and that was neck and head. And for the head, I used two hex nuts with uh, googly eyes because science needs more googly eyes. <laughs> and just some really weird like doll hair I had in my – back room of my my physics lab i don't know why um <laughs> and so these things looked horrible i made two of them and they looked absolutely horrible um, please please do share a photo with us so i can put on the instagram for our listeners i yeah i have i have one somewhere and uh so we we did it two ways we did a, a drop of gwen stacy to kind of model that two ways we did string and then i made a bungee cord out of interlinked rubber bands over and over and mm -hmm. over and so I showed the students, showed my students the original panels from uh, Spider-Man, I believe it's 123, back in 1973. That story is still powerful. It still is really powerful, especially when you can kind of go out, narrate it through panel by panel. Because that last bit was when Spidey pulled her up. It's heartbreaking. And so the kids were emotionally invested. One, comic books – are colorful and it's Spider-Man and it's, they're kind of familiar with the story. And so they were emotionally invested. And so I'm like, all right, let's model this. Let's see what is at the, what physics is at the root of this problem. So my first one was Gwen on the string, which is inflexible, didn't stretch at all. And mm -hmm. so I dropped her from about, about eight, nine feet. She stopped suddenly when the string jerked and stopped her. She stopped so suddenly that that thin piece of spaghetti that was modeling her neck broke. And her head oh, came no. off and rolled away. And, oh, no. and I had one student just go, oh. <laughs> and it was just, it was, it was shocking, kind of almost, you know, it, it was something that was just, had it been any other kind of model, it would have almost been too graphic to show. But it got, mm -hmm. it got the point across. And then I showed it with the interlocking rubber bands, a bungee cord or a stretchy Spider Man web, um, stretchier than the one he used in the comic and in the movie. And, Head stayed attached and she was fine. And so from there, we talked about momentum and impulse and why you want to slow down over a longer period of time than come to a sudden stop. And so I had done this problem, this worksheet I had to go along with it. I'd done it for a couple years now. This was the first year I modeled it. And I had one student a few years back that said, Mr. Brady, you know, I really wasn't sure about this class until we did that Gwen Stacy thing. And I thought, you know, physics is kind of cool. I'm going to stay with this class. And that, that's, that's it. That's the reward. That's, that's awesome. The, yeah. You know, I held, I held her on to it. And, you know, she's, she's in college now. She's not going into physics, but 
you know, at least she, she knows how to think about things from a physics perspective. She knows a little bit more and she, she got an education, at least for the time I had her in science. And, you know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Science is a process. It's not a body of knowledge. It's a way of seeing mm -hmm. the world, a way of thinking of things. I think a, a big thing I was hoping to explore more was the ways that this, the science, it's not just limited to physics. Like physics is the obvious one off. This is the fun thing that we can poke fun at or play with. But there's so many other ways that science can affect these different curricula and really make whatever topic you're trying to teach engaging. And not just science, but also just the fact that these pop cultural elements didn't just magically come out of nowhere. They came based on things that do come from around us, whether they are old literature or physics itself. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's that's one of the things um, that I do I, – I bring out now and then because I, I infuse pop culture into my lessons, uh, you know, partly to keep the kids interested, my students interested, mm -hmm. and partly to keep me interested. Um, <laughs> you know, I can do – I can do atomic theory and the history of nuclear science. You know, I, I can do that. I would much rather do that and kind of throw a tag on at the end of the Incredible Hulk and the Fantastic Four and how in the, that age when we didn't know particularly what radiation was, it was, it was the big bad. It was the thing or the big good, depending on if you, I guess if you were the Hulk or if you were, you know, Spider-Man. Um, but, yeah, where where these things came from and the the role that you know science played and the origin of these things. I like I like now that um I kind of trace this back once on a on a just on a riff um at a at a conference of how we've gone through let's see, what did we go through? So Stan and Stan was pretty much Stan and Jack were pretty much radiation and radiation was a yeah, so Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Yes, yes, sorry. And then um in the 70s and 80s we kind of moved into some biology um still still radiation was pretty scary and uh we did cyberpunk because no one really was sure what the internet was going to be like or mm -hmm. you know william gibson's worlds of crazy virtual reality and so that had a role in creating some characters and and now it seems like the the big unknown is um dark matter and so dark matter is doing the heavy lifting that radiation once did in the creation of characters. I thought you were going to say genetics. Yeah. Yeah. There's, 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 yeah, you're right. CRISPR, I guess. I really don't want to bother our listeners too much with it, but the long story short is CRISPR is this incredibly cheap, accessible tool that scientists can use to make large scale genetic edits to an animal to introduce a new gene that might make them glow or make them stronger or whatever. And there have been some retcons of Spider-Man where Spider-Man was not exposed to a radioactive spider. He's exposed to a genetically engineered spider that CRISPR'd him right. into becoming Spider-Man. Well, that was, I believe that was Miles. Um, Miles Morales, yeah. who was uh, exactly. Spider-Man. Into the Spider-Verse, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And so it's it's interesting of, uh, I like to think of it as the unknown and it's the potential to do these things. Uh, dark matter, dark matter specifically is um, the Flash and, and the CW DC heroes. They do a lot with dark matter um, mm -hmm. and CRISPR as well as it's the unknown and kind of interesting, exciting and scary at the same time. And, you know, of course, that stuff that that's affecting us as a culture, kind of affecting us on the unconscious of our of our creative side and so of course that these characters come out with powers that are based in these things that we don't really aren't sure of and kind of scare us at the same time and some would argue that's a good thing there's you can find ways to make your like you said with the speed force there are ways to make your sci-fi thing its own thing and that encourages people to play with the imagination of that space but the more you try to say this real world science thing led to this other thing Without doing the footwork, finding people like sci-fi consultants to come and double check or give you a realistic approach to how to say, this is how you inject this idea into your story, it can really not necessarily do a disservice to just the science, but also to the thing you were trying to do in the first place, share this amazing story. Right, right, exactly. And that's, I, I think, where we have to give credit to um, Marvel Studios uh, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They really uh, lean on science consultants that they've pulled in a number of science consultants for 
I think at this point, almost all of their movies, um, mm-hmm. guys like Clifford Johnson, a uh, physicist, um, and Sean Carroll um, have done work to explain things and kind of help the the story writers understand it a little bit. And I've got nothing but praise for for Marvel Studios. Yeah, the science still has to be fantastic and fictional at the end of the day. But uh, in, in the case of Black Panther, it's fantastic and fictional. And I would also add it's inspirational. Well, Matt, I think this has been an, an absolutely phenomenal conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. Is there any, how can we get in touch with you? If people want to learn more about the science or they want to get in touch with you and ask you to be on their podcast or <laughs> learn more about how to do your curriculums, where can they find you? Please go to the science We just kind of relaunched the website a little while ago and we're still, both my wife and I are working teachers. So we're just I think today was our actual first day without students and, and end of school. Um, so mm-hmm. we're just getting things back up and running. But the scienceof.org has kind of two areas. It has articles where I've written about pop culture and science and a forum um, for STEM teachers to get on and discuss ideas, help people out, especially especially STEM teachers, because we need all the help we can get on getting our kids interested and staying interested in science. Also, uh, this October, October 1st, um, I have a book coming out. It is The Science of Rick and Morty, which is um, it, the title kind of gives it away. It is <laughs> it is The Science of Rick and Morty. So everything that we just talked about, got a whole book for you coming out. It's October 1st from Simon & Schuster, and it can be pre-ordered on Amazon right now. So... You might want to check that out. If you were kind enough, we'll keep a link to it in the show notes for anyone who's interested in checking it out. Matt, thank you so much. Uh, as for us at Sweating the Small Stuff, you can find all of our stuff online at Small Stuff Show. We have a Reddit, so feel free to go there and check out and comment on all of our episodes as we post them. Make sure to tell us what we get right, what you like, what you don't like. And definitely give Matt a shout out over there. It's our Small Stuff Show. And I'm your personal brain trainer, Cameron Boozer Jamiri, reminding you from movies to media to the world around us, it's details like these that make it worth sweating the small stuff. I had a great time. That was that was a lot of fun. And poor Gwen Stacy. <laughs> they were traumatized students.